Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Triangle Computer Science Distinguished Lecture Seminar. Uh, my name is In Jong Ri, uh, Professor of Computer Science at North Carolina State University. Uh, it is my personal honor to introduce you to uh, Dr. Mario Jola. Uh, Los Angeles. Uh, Dr. Jolla is extremely well known in the uh, uh, in the area of the mobile ad hoc network, or we call it Mane. Uh, he is uh, most well known for uh, his work on uh, distributed clustering and multicast protocols called ODMRP and CodeCast, and also uh, a lot of you should be familiar with his uh, TCP congestion control algorithm called TCP Westwood, which is designed for the uh, over wireless networks and also for long distance and fast. Um, uh, Dr. Jola worked on the ARPA project in the 70s, uh, which is on uh, the early version of the internet with the Professor Kleinlock at UCLA. And after graduating from UCLA with PhD in uh, 1976, uh, Dr. Jola's career has taken him over uh, 30 years of research and at UCLA as a professor. Uh, today he will talk about another project of his uh, on vehicle uh, communications for uh, safe navigation, uh, urban sensing, and location awareness. And the title of his talk uh, is Vehicular Urban Sensing, Dissemination, and Retrieval. And he will be illuminating uh, how vehicle sensing uh, is different from the conventional wireless sensing and the some related applications. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Mario. <coughs> okay. In John, thank you very much for your uh, introduction and invitation. And Franz, thank you for the excellent organization of this uh, visit. And I have to say that this is the second time I'm coming to uh, University of uh, not Carolina State University, you know, uh, right. But this is a Freudian slip because I came here to interview, you know. I came here in 77 to interview. I liked the campus, a small group, but then uh, UCLA made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So but it's always good to come back and, and see this uh, department now grown from nine to uh, over 40. So yes, the talk today, on uh, vehicular network. This is something that has occupied me for, for the past three or four years. Um, and I'll be talking about a specific application of dissemination and retrieval. Um, so this is the outline of my presentation. Um, I'll give you a general introduction of vehicular ad hoc network, explaining how they are placed within uh, the area of vanets. Um, then I'll move to uh, the application. So I'll not be spending much time on routing and so forth, but rather I'll move to the applications uh, and content distribution and also urban sensing, which would be the major idea here. I'll uh, give some hints uh, um, on what uh, we've done in terms of uh, uh, using by inspired algorithms, and this is similar to what uh, other researchers like King John have been doing here. Also, uh, the security issues, and finally, I conclude with the test bed that we're building at UCLA. All right, so just to connect with uh, what most of you should be familiar with, uh, traditional manets, what are they? Well, these are networks that, uh, so manet stands for mobile ad hoc network. So these mobile networks uh, have been used uh, by the military since uh, the beginning of uh, times, I would say, just after the ARPANET was uh, was invented in 69, the military found a way of using the uh, manets for their uh, tactical areas. So these networks are uh, useful because uh, they're instantly deployable, reconfigurable, and they're designed to satisfy a temporary need. The better is one, but also applications such as uh, disaster recovery, um, floods, uh, whatever. So most of the applications are civilian, right? Um, the important characteristic, of course, is mobility. And mobility comes with low energy, because uh, uh, most of, uh, in the past, uh, we're talking about handheld. 
So uh, with, uh, with batteries, they will deplete uh, very quickly. Um, these networks will be multi-hop, of course, with a single hop uh, wireless lens we are used to. Multi-hopping because uh, um, of energy limitations. You can't reach all the other parties with just one single hop. And if you boost up the power too high, then no one else can talk. So as you understand from this description, there are enormous challenges in the design of uh, manets. We mentioned energy. so you operate with low energy um, algorithms, routing in a mobile environment. TCP in this environment is even worse. But work has been done in, the, in, uh, in uh, this area for, for the past uh, 30 years. So we have a number of algorithms ready for that. So, and then eventually, after all the uh, military and civilian applications, here comes an application that seems to be ideally suited for this type of work. The vehicles, you know, vehicles are cars, you know, and uh, vehicle networks. And you say, so our expectation was that we could use all the techniques that we developed for managed to vehicle, vehicular uh, architecture. But let us take a look it goes a look at, uh, at what the uh, vehicle network looks like. Now, you remember in Manets, we said there is no fixed infrastructure. Well, if you look at the uh, vehicle network in, a, in an urban environment, there is certainly the cellular infrastructure. All the drivers have a cell phone. Now, Wi-Fi, uh, access points are emerging. Maybe in the future, WiMAC, satellite. So there is not one, but several infrastructure. So that is already one uh, um, um, characteristic that um, makes the, these manets different from the conventional manets. Temporary need, well, some of the application of vehicles are very, very permanent, like uh, safety. You know, it's not a temporary. Mobile, yes, they're definitely mobile, but low energy is not uh, an issue anymore because uh, vehicles have plenty of energy. Now, multi-hop routing, well, as you'll see in my presentation, most of the applications actually do not require multi-hops. They're just uh, nearest neighbor. So this is a bit disappointing to us because we said, gee, what kind of an um, ad hoc network do we have? Well, actually, this is the ad hoc network that I like to define as opportunistic ad hoc network. So you can actually communicate to the infrastructure, unless uh, there are some particular reasons why you wouldn't do that, either because it is too expensive, or because it would be unsafe, or uh, because it would be uh, introducing too much delay. Say, for instance, if I want to avoid uh, crashing against the car in front of me, you know, going through uh, an SMS wouldn't probably be the most useful, you know, opportune things to do. Or because the infrastructure failed, like the Katrina situation, right? Okay. So it's a bit of a disappointment because uh, this structure seems to be very different from what we've seen before. However, on the positive side, now Bannets open up a brand new set of problems. And in fact, that's one here. That's why probably most of you are interested in looking at Bannets. Now, the fact that you got more power on the vehicles means that you can use more sophisticated radios, with MIMOS, cognitive radios, especially for emergency situations, you want to go uh, several kilometers away. So these are the radios that will make sense on vehicles. Also, you have the problem of position. You know, uh, If GPS is not available, then uh, there are no sort of problems come up. At the network layer, uh, um, I'll show that mobility models are very important to uh, um, iron out and uh, develop so that they are realistic. Um, and in fact, this is an area that some of you are working on here in this department. Network coding uh, is uh, becoming important to overcome some of the disruptions in, in vehicles. Uh, routing, instead of traditional routing, with GPS you do geo-routing. And also content-based routing. So in a, in, a, in a network, it's not so much a case of sending the message to uh, uh, Injun Ri who's driving on a 
here in Raleigh or Durham, you know, but rather sending a message to all the ambulances, you know, within a three kilometer radius. So it's content based routing to some particular use. And finally, delay tolerant routing. Because uh, vehicle networks tend to become disconnected, right? And uh, some of the applications, and particularly the ones I'm describing, can tolerate delays. So the, the issue is how do you best uh, route packets to uh, a set of user, maybe content. Uh, find users in a delay tolerant way. Uh, the next topic in the, is security and privacy. Now security, well if you have a military network, an emergency network, there are some special uh, security uh, issues that apply, issue apply, but in a vehicular case privacy becomes the dominant concern, you know. You want to uh, be anonymous, you know, when you talk to other vehicles, and uh, we'll say more about that later. So, the, finally, a set of new applications. You know, in the conventional manets, you want to go from A to B, so the ad hoc networks are used just for transport. Here, the nodes actually participate, your content distribution, nodes sense our sensors, so there are a number of applications coming up. So, I think that uh, in spite of the fact that we can't use all the results already developed for the conventional manets, with Vanets, we have uh, a lot of more exciting, equally exciting problems to work on. But these are difficult, different from what we've seen before. Okay, so uh, just to set this, you know, in, uh, the stage here, and uh, um, the enabling standard for vehicle communications is uh, the IEEE-811P standard. This is a is a MacLayer standard that defines the communications among cars. It is also known as DSRC. Now, this standard is derived from A211A, so you're, most of you are familiar with it. And uh, the difference is that uh, it defines different channels, vehicle to vehicle, for ad hoc communications. Outside and also control broadcast channel. So, this is just the physical and MacLayer. More standards have been developed for uh, routing, uh, beaconing, and, uh, and applications. But uh, the fact that this was approved uh, uh, last year has already set in motion entire uh, industry to develop uh, uh, radios. And in fact, so the cars in the future will be equipped with the radios, but cars are also equipped with all sorts of other uh, yes, devices. Uh, in particular, there's an increasing interest in equipping cars with uh, radars to avoid collisions, video cameras, and we think that in the future, actually, the manufacturers will compete with each other through the electronics that is used on cars. And this is important for what I'm going to say in a moment, too. So, many applications that we uh, uh, would use communications for. So, um, the first and foremost application for car manufacturer is safety, you know, too many people die on the road, and uh, it has been recognized that with efficient communications we could avoid many of these accidents, uh, but other, and I'm, actually I'm going to go through most of these, but besides safe navigation, we are also interested in efficient navigation, so saving people's time, urban sensing, uh, cars that sense the environment communicate. And uh, cars also will uh, um, pick up information which is location relevant and uh, communicate with others. So let's uh, just go through these, uh, some of these uh, applications in more detail. So safe navigation, uh, you're driving towards uh, the intersection. And uh, so if there is a car speeding, uh, from the other direction, that's a collision, right? But uh, in intelligent, so the, the, the vision here is that uh, if the car is under control, so the car could communicate with the um, traffic light, right? So the message same, you know, going at this speed, such and such, into a traffic light, I can read, uh, I can get the information, and I can slam on the brake. So propagating the information. I, I, clearly, you would like to do that all uh, 
automatically. So the car itself goes down. There is, of course, an issue of liability here because uh, what if the system doesn't work? Then I crash and then I'm going to sue the company. So there are liability issues uh, involved in implementing these uh, safe navigation procedures progressively. So typically these uh, messages are advisory messages. So There are warnings and I then slam on the brake. So safe navigation, you can see here an example of safe navigation. So, uh, and in fact, right now, cars are exchanging messages with each other every, every 100 milliseconds. So there is a lot of traffic anticipated for this application. And one of the research issues is to maintain traffic below an acceptable level. So in this case, a vehicle uh, So this vehicle uh, driver is distracted. The message goes to the driver behind, so and the driver behind can take an evasive action. And you can imagine, I mean, most of the accidents happen because people fall asleep and so forth. If we could propagate that information, that could be of use. So that was uh, safe navigation. Uh, but uh, messaging all also helps for efficient navigation. So here we want to save people's time. Now, we are all familiar with navigators, right? Now, a new navigator uh, company came, a service uh, was introduced, uh, just came to market last year, called Dash Express. So in Dash Express, if you subscribe to the system, your screen, and you want to go, say, to the airport, you're finished, your screen will show you the best path. But at the same time, uh, the, the server, the Dash Express server, picks up information from other members of this service who are driving to the same destination, right? And uh, clocks their position, right? And uh, can therefore determine that, well, maybe the, the path that we gave you is too slow. These guys are driving too forever, and there are better paths. And they give you alternate path based on information provided by, by other subscribers, right? So this would be then that you could use a vehicle to infrastructure information to give better, better path. So, and uh, you can extend that vehicle to vehicle in, in the case that the infrastructure is not available all the time. So, uh, and uh, another example is uh, of vehicle to vehicle use for uh, um, efficient navigation is the intelligent transport system, and when this is one of the things we proposed in, in our papers, um, intelligent lane reservation. So before you leave home, you know, in the future you may reserve a spot on a lane. You pay a certain number of dollars, and then you drive up, and then there will be room for you. And if you forgot to do it from home, you can perhaps reserve while you are en route. En route. It costs you more. But then the issue is to enforce, enforce. How do, and this is a major problem, you know. So you have to put policemen there to check. It doesn't work. So one way you can enforce is to peer-to-peer -peer enforcement. So if you paid $100 to drive to Durham from uh, Raleigh, you know, in uh, rush hour, and uh, then uh, your car discovered the guy in front of you didn't pay, so you have an incentive. Okay, so you understand how peer-to-peer uh, -peer can be used in this case. Um, in the area of uh, uh, environment sensing vehicles, so I've been used to do traffic monitoring, and Dash ExpressNet is an example. And uh, there are many of the projects that use actually position and time data to figure out the traffic from uh, messages from the cars. But you can also do pollution probing. In fact, we uh, plan to do that at UCLA. And in London, a colleague of mine has instrumented already buses to monitor pollution. So reporting here to peer eventually to serve paving conditions, uh, as you understand. And also urban surveillance. There are disturbances or actions. Cars can see that. And, uh, and in fact, have an application to just uh, explain how that can be supported by vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. Um, 
Location-ready content delivery and sharing. Uh, now, this content, location-ready content can be generated from the internet, so vendors may uh, send information about uh, their uh, menus, they will be advertising, or uh, uh, this information can be just uh, picked up by the driver themselves. Somebody, suppose you go to a, a resort, a beach, take pictures, or a club, you know, and then uh, you can then uh, upload that information to other cars, you can make it available. So, share that information, car to car, transaction to information. Uh, advertising, that's what I said before, instead of using uh, billboards, which are not very aesthetic, advertising, you go to, to vehicles, you go, you go past access points, and then shared in a car to car in a dissemination mode. So, incidentally, we talked about delayed torrent application, this is clearly a delayed torrent application, you know. An advertisement comes in to a vehicle, you don't have to instantly propagate it to the entire network. You just, in fact, you may be getting it, and then if somebody requests it, you give it to them, you know. Avoid, uh, and, you know, commerce is another thing, so you want to sell things. In this case, uh, there are used, some vehicles may propagate uh, information they want to sell, some others what they want to buy, and so there is a meeting in the, in, the, in the urban scenario, and then the deal is done. Okay, so these are all uh, applications, and uh, now uh, one, and to support these applications, you have to develop peer-to-peer uh, -peer protocols that are suitable for it, you know, and one protocol that we develop was CarTorrent, our torrent, little to big torrent, as you see, cooperative download of location multimedia files. Now, probably some of you already have seen this presentation, maybe as sure in John saw it already, <laughs> maybe indirectly. But uh, to motivate this uh, example, I look at uh, the Los Angelenos. I go to Las Vegas. It's a long drive, four hours in the desert, so very boring. So you turn on the radio, listen to the radio. Uh, and uh, the radio says, well, there is a new show in Las Vegas uh, in, in 10 megabytes, video clip for you to decide if it is worth going and seeing, you know, the preview. Uh, but 10 megabytes is quite a large, uh, size, you know, size file if you want to, for G, uh, GSM, you know. And you know I'm much, very much else in the desert there. Uh, so one thing you have to do is just stop at the gas station, all the gas stations with uh, internet and satellite, so you may get it there, uh, and that's fine. But, you know, this is some problem, because uh, stopping the gas station is loose and source, it could be very dangerous. If there is a lot of traffic, you would stop and come up. That would be a cause of possible accidents. Too slow for GPRS and 3G. Maybe, hey, with 4G, uh, you'll make it, but uh, it will cost you. Now, there is one thing here that works in our favor. Many other drivers are driving the same way. They may have heard the same uh, program, and so they're interested in the download. So this is the ideal uh, trigger for the current kind of proposition. I presume most of you are current, so cooperative downloading. And the way it will work here is that uh, you hear the, so you heard the announcement, so when you go past the access point, you say, please give me, you, know, you contact uh, the tracker in the internet, and the tracker will say, yes, you get this uh, first piece. And by the way, you know, the next point, you know, another 15 people uh, were interested in downloading the past 30 seconds, so you know someone else has done it. Well, then, See, one packet, probably one megabit, is all you can download from the access point unless you stop. Uh, but that is enough to get you going because once you get going, then, uh, see, in, in BitTorrent, of course, you go to the tracker, the tracker will give you the uh, list of the um, other users who are downloading the same file. Here, you do not have the list. You have to discover the users yourself. So you proceed, you start interrogating your neighbors, and then uh, once you find the neighbor with the piece that you're missing, then you, you, uh, you download it and you also upload to others. So it is the same situation as in BitTorrent. And you stick around until you have uh, 
satisfied other, other users. Basically, the whole thing propagates back, backwards, and it works, you know. If it doesn't work, well, you can always stop at the next gas station or a McDonald's franchise and download. So, this is the idea. And, uh, by the way, another issue to note here is that communications are among neighbors. It would be one of a way to observate most. You're not going to go several miles away, you know. You, want, you, you hope that you can get everything done uh, locally. So it's a proximity type routing. However, even this scheme has turned as limitation because the piece selection is critical. In fact, uh, suppose the piece that uh, you're looking for is in a car three hops away. So you set up your TCP connection and you suffer. In fact, we did some experiments and discovered that uh, when you choose the piece, you should give priority not to the, and in big turn, you choose the rarest piece. So if the rarest piece is three hops away, uh, but there are other pieces you can use locally, you go to those first because that three, that rare piece, the hops away may be difficult to get to TCP. And chances are there may be another vehicle with the same piece I mean, pose it to you because this situation is much more dynamic than the typical bit turn situation, right? Things change. And um, anyway, <coughs> piece selection is critical, but there are frequent failures in, uh, in a vehicle environment because uh, your connection fails if a truck moves in. Uh, what can we do? Well, we would like to make the communications more robust in the uh, highway. One way we chose was to use network coding. Now, some of you may have heard of network coding, and it is a technique uh, which uh, uh, allows you to mix packets at the network level, right? Um, it comes from intermixed, and then uh, um, you put some information in the packet, such as the destination, you can uh, recover the original packets from the network. Now, if you uh, know network coding, forgive me, but you know, for, for those of you who do not network coding, do not know network coding, I have this little mini tutorial, you know, the slide that explains how things work. And this technique actually is called random linear network coding. Okay, so imagine that these first four cars are driving to Las Vegas, you know, and uh, they have the four pieces of a in this case would be four packets. They have received the request from the other cars coming from below, and uh, so they pump back the packets, you know, one hop away. And that's fine, the first layer, that's fine. But the second layer, notice that the green car here has just these two packets, it combines them, and if you did it on a bit by bit basis, it would be like an exclusive OR, but if you, in, in more sophisticated in the recording, you do it on a byte by byte basis, octets, and you do a uh, field operation. So you add these uh, bytes and uh, you send the mixed packets down one layer, and the thing continues until the, the car, uh, the receiver here, uh, the, the, you know, in, the, in the rear of this convoy, gets, say, four mixed packets. Now, for these four mixed packets, the driver must recover the original packet. How can he do it? Well, the trick is that when packets are mixed, you know, um, there is an encoding vector in the preamble of these packets that tell how the packet was mixed. So, basically, as the packet percolates down, the, 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 the preamble tells you what is the component, what are the ingredients of this packet. So here, then maybe say, 15% uh, of the green packets, 25% of the bad packet, and so forth. Well, based on this information, then you can set up a system of equation and retrieve the original packet from the set. And you can actually speed up things by doing Gaussian elimination. And this can actually be, can be done. In fact, we've implemented, and we call this code turn. We've implemented on laptops, and uh, we are also implementing that in uh, 
cell phones and others have also implementing cell phones. Cell phones, you have a problem of energy because this takes energy time. On cars, we are a bit better off. But the performance has been uh, quite impressive because uh, um, so what you want to do is uh, the performance measure is uh, how fast can you complete the download of the file. You can so the green curve here, and you have the average number of completions per slot. So on average, so it takes uh, uh, with the with the car current, which is a green curve, it takes about 400 seconds. But you have uh, tails at uh, almost uh, you know 1,000 or 1,000. 400 slots, and each slot is a second, so this is quite a bit of weight, you know? So, car current, and uh, this was with 20 nodes in the, in the pack, and 40% popularity, so 40% of the user trying to download. With code current, you see that the sharp uh, completion, every completes in at most 100 seconds, and the average is 100, so you have a one, a one in terms of average, an improvement one over five, and in terms of a worst case, an improvement of one over one over ten. So, consider improvement here. And, uh, and, uh, there are many more statistics. In fact, we just uh, a paper on this came out in this again, you know, and you can look at there. But uh, we also compare current and current for uh, different speeds. This is the average download time, right? And uh, for 20 nodes, as you saw before, car current requires on average 500 uh, seconds versus 100 seconds for a foot torrent. But there is also another interesting uh, uh, um, phenomenon here. You know, these three colors correspond to three speeds. So 10 meters per second, 20 and 30 meters per second. So you see that um, with, uh, and that's impact on mobility on the, on the particular protocol car torrent, the faster nodes move, the worse performance uh, gets. The reason is, and whereas in, in code torrent, the performance improves. Well, the reason is a subtle reason, but, and it is important actually to point out that speed helps the dissemination because as car, the faster cars are moving, the faster I can distribute uh, the pieces to the vehicles, and we'll actually we'll, this will come back again in another application. However, and this so this will be good for both car and car torrent. Uh, however, in car torrent, you're doing sometimes multi hop routing. You're looking for uh, pieces which are two or three hops away. So you're doing routing your TCP, and so that gives you performance degradation. And also the reason why with car torrent, uh, the car torrent doesn't scale the number of nodes is that the more nodes you put in, the, the, the higher the congestion to the multipath, whereas car torrent scales very nicely. Right? So you see the effect of speed, right, and the effect of density. So car torrent seems to be a winner in both cases. Okay, so that's the application uh, regarding the content Dissemination, content comes from the internet and then you push to other people. Now, the next application I want to discuss here is uh, vehicle sensing. So, now the vehicles generate their own content. So, the vehicles are moving around, picking up uh, images, and, uh, and sharing them with the other nodes. Actually, the vehicles can do two things either send whatever they observe to the internet. So in Dash Express, right? Or they can propagate it to the, to the other cars. And there are pros and cons for each of these solutions. So the vehicles is a, a VSN enabled vehicle, vehicle sensor network enabled, has sensors, and then a, a, it has a computer, and, a, and it has applications that can process for your data, and it has protocols to disseminate. So why do we sense? Well, this we saw before. We pick up the environment, and this is just a passive environment. And also we pick up the possible uh, activities. These are human-caused activities, accidents, terrorist alerts, and this kind. 
So let us look at the scenario just to so that we understand the, the, the procedure that we are proposing. So suppose there, there has been an accident here, these two cars crashed, you know, and uh, bystanders, the blue cars, have seen uh, the accident, right? So they, the camera, they, they pick up the, that information and then they proceed and they are communicating that information to others, right? So, and this could be other done by public cars, you know, for privacy reasons, or in the future maybe even private cars, participating in the sensing of uh, data. So, and the cars continue to collect images, those called sounds, and store the data locally. Process the data, so determine what kind of uh, information they picked up. For instance, it could be a license plate, it could be a, uh, a shot, it could be a crash. And, uh, and they classify the event as metadata, so type could be license plate, option. Well, there, is, there was also a loud noise. Location is where I was when I got this data and time, and my vehicle ID. So this is the metadata that I would like to enter in some kind of database because whoever wants to look for witnesses would look at this data. And then once they find the data, even the vehicle leave, they can find me from some other uh, location-based service. Oh, in, uh, in our approach, because uh, uh, in our system for mobiles, we distribute the metadata to neighbors using probabilistically. So we disseminate it. We call it gossip. And, uh, and in fact, I have an example in a moment showing what. And then the police retrieves the data from the vehicle. So let me show in uh, this animation what, what is happening. So these cars have uh, witnessed they picked up some information. And they decide to disseminate information to others. So there is an exchange. You know, I, and uh, you can propagate it uh, one time. And per year, say every, every 10 seconds, you pump out information, right? And so that gets spread out. Uh, in most cases, information you pick up and disseminate is not of useful to anyone. But in this case, suppose that there, were, there had been an accident there. The police is called in to investigate. So the police agent will uh, issue a harvest H. Rex stands for harvesting request. So it tells you, look, I'm looking for uh, someone who was uh, at that particular location right, at that time and uh, was able to pick up, say, uh, license plate numbers. And you, yourself, have the information. You can respond positively. Also, if you obtain that information directly through dissemination, so you give that data to this guy. So, so the harvesting by policemen, by agents, means uh, navigating through the area and picking up as many metadata records as you can. And then you follow up and find the vehicles. We're not discuss discussing that, but that can be done if you use uh, a geolocation server. So, but, so we just showed one way to uh, store and retrieve the metadata. Now, of course, there are several options for, uh, for managing this data data, metadata. And one way is uh, to upload the metadata to the nearest access point. And that is what we saw in uh, Access Press. That's what the Cartel Project at MIT does. And, uh, and it makes very much sense if the information is of general use. You know, everyone is interested in, in traffic. But you know, if I want to upload all the license plates I see while I drive to work, that probably wouldn't be that, that very useful to clog the network, right? Uh, another approach is to flood the data to all the vehicles in the urban environment. Well, in some uh, dire situation, like a bomb threat, that could be justified. But otherwise, that would definitely also clog the vehicle or network. Uh, there is there be proposal to use uh, public subscribe models, where you define uh, a vehicle in the system where everything gets uploaded, right? 
uh, the only problem is that uh, vehicles move and then uh, go out of range, so mobility is a major issue here. Uh, you can be more sophisticated and use the DC with hash table, so you, you can hash to various intersections, you know, if you're familiar with peer to peer, it can be done. But then again, if there is no permanent car in intersection, you have to keep passing the data from one to the other car. So all of these schemes have problems, right? That's the size of the data that uh, you do. So you propose a pyramid diffusion because uh, of dissemination. Trade off between making the information available for further search and also your economical in terms of uh, transmission. Just keep it for yourself, except for this periodic uh, transmission to neighbors so that the information spreads and it can be then efficiently searched if necessary. So, this is the idea. We call the scheme uh, mobiles, right? So, uh, in this case, <coughs> mobile nodes periodically broadcast, only the originator advertises the metadata. Neighbors store the advertisement in their local memory. They don't rebroadcast. In our case, that turns out to be sufficient for efficient collection. And you drop the stale data. Nobody requested the data within a few hours. Just throw it away. And the mobile agent will then have the metadata moving to a certain area <coughs> and start interrogating. And you can use a blue filter for efficient uh, search. OK, so this is the uh, technique that uh, we have uh, implemented. Both in the simulation, also we've done some measurements. But uh, the results here are simulation results. And um, the particular um, test bed was uh, westward. This is a tiger map to download it. <coughs> Simulate is NS2. And the vehicles uh, are moving with a speed from 5 to 35 meters per second. And 25 meters per second is already quite an aggressive speed for westward. Probably would be on the order of 100 kilometers an hour. Certainly a ticket, but <laughs> uh, that's kind of the upper end. And one, actually, one interesting uh, uh, question we're actually asking ourselves. It was the impact of mobility in this uh, uh, process. We already before we saw the high speed was favoring the uh, distribution of content in a capture end. And so we said, well, let us use, but, but you want it here to be more specific, not only the speed, but also the type of model. So we use uh, two models a random waypoint model in which cars move sort of randomly, you know, proceeding from on one direction and then uh, turn around the other direction. So, so there is a major intermixing. Real track model is a model um, where nodes move along the track. So nodes move in group along a segment of the street and then at the intersection they split based on some probabilities. So that, if you're careful in doing that, that mimics a, a more regular commuting pattern, you know. So, and these are the results. Uh, this first set shows the, the harvesting with a random waypoint. So remember now, nodes are moving these vehicles, and we have uh, 300 vehicles moving randomly. Um, now, we immediately notice that uh, with uh, 25 meters a second, the number of, so the total number of summer is 300, one per car. We assume that the police agent wants to collect all the Summary, you know, it says so the police moves in westward and randomly also, uh, although in, in a moment I'll show some more clever ways to do it. And if the cars are moving fast enough, in 100 seconds it has collected all the summaries. If the cars are slower, 5 meters per second, instead of 100 seconds, it will take it 6 times. So there is almost a proportionality. So the slower the vehicles, the longer it will take to follow. This is actually as we expect, you know. And this was for random waypoint. But let us see what happens if now the motion of the cars is correlated. That is, they move along track. Well, the scale is different here. But remember, we were able to, with 25 meters per second, we were able to collect all the summaries in 100 seconds. Now it takes 600 seconds. 
So what a bit of a difference. One text to the other. So what's happening here? What is happening is that we random uh, with the random way point motion, there is a any a very good chance that I get exposed, the police agent gets exposed to all the possible summaries, right? In a short period of time, then if he drives to a system with uh, with a correlation, right? And the secondly, more importantly, if the cars are all driving in the same direction, they will exchange the data to their neighbors, and they don't, and they still stay in a pack. So the, the distribution of data is less efficient. So uh, a random waypoint. So if you use a random waypoint to to uh, study your protocols, you are not uh, um, getting a, a good uh, assessment of the efficiency because uh, we know that. Uh, Drivers typically do not drive randomly in, in a in a other situation, and they're more uh, probably more more typically it's a correlated pattern. So that was important. It's not only us, but everybody has realized the importance of of uh, motion. Now, we also looked at uh, ways of making the search more efficient, right? Because uh, the search is challenging. You know, if you have a large so a city blocks just one agent stuff for the agent to find everything. So we said, let's say multiple agents do the harvesting. But then the issue is, well, the multiple agents may actually, I may go back to areas already harvested by others, right? And how can I make things more efficient? Well, we worked on this problem with a, with a biologist who told us about the way social, uh, so animals solve this problem, you know? Origin, and, and uh, in fact, the example that we follow is that of bacteria. We call it bacteria that forage uh, in uh, testing, doing all sorts of things. Uh, and apparently, they the strategy follows a greedy approach with random search. They find something interesting. They sit uh, in a, in an area, and then uh, uh, they take longer jumps if uh, there is uh, no new uh, data. So we use this approach. And we call it data taxes, which means that it is driven by data. My motion is driven by the data. Uh, and if you look at this uh, diagram, then suppose I find something interesting in an area, so I do a constraint walk, I interrogate car by car. If I don't find uh, anything interesting of the data has been already foraged, then I take a slight bigger jump, and then eventually I take this what you call a levy jump, which is totally non-coordinated. And actually, Henri is one of the creators of the jump idea, so he knows about that very well. And, and uh, this, as you see, gave us a much better performance than just doing a, a, a uniform search in the. So, this allows us to avoid collecting the same data by different agents, and uh, it's sort of a thermal trail because whenever an agent pumps the data from uh, from a vehicle, it just marks it. And uh, so the uh, setup that we use, and simulation setup, uh, is an urban grid where the uh, there is a information generated on street six and two. So here there is useful information, uh, and, uh, and cars actually, after they have information, they move uh, randomly through the grid, but there is a predominant presence in. Uh, Two, uh, we assume there are four agents harvesting the area. So candidate algorithms, candidate search algorithms are random walk foraging, where you just do the But yes, random foraging means that uh, you, based on what you find, you direct your search accordingly. Um, preset pattern foraging, you are told that uh, you should look at six and two, so that's the best of all world. And then data taxes foraging means that you do the local search and then you take longer jumps to get uh, something more productive, and these are the results. Clearly, uh, the aggregating number of RV summaries is a performance measure, and you want to collect the most summary, summaries, right, in a given time. This is, uh, 
Japan, and uh, by, say, say, four agents, one, two, three, four, you see that the number of samples you collect increases the number of agents. This is consistent with all the methods. But uh, <clears throat> the random walk was uh, the worst performance, gave the least number of summaries, followed by the Bayes random walk. Surprisingly, the uh, preset foraging, where you have the a priori knowledge of uh, where the data is, performs not much better than uh, the uh, data taxing, in some cases even worse. So we can say that this data taxing is pretty good. So the bioinspired scheme give us. So time is short. So here I'm going to have one more topic, and I'm going to go through this. It's a very important topic, but uh, I'll just give you a hint of what to, we are interested in. So vehicular security. Now, um, security is extremely important in vehicular networks because uh, um, vehicles pick up information and so and they propagate that to the neighbor or maybe ice on the road and so propagate that to the neighbors and I one thing I tell the neighbors is hey my, my car is uh, uh, we're heating and forced to slow down or, or maybe the car tells well this drive is falling asleep so this information that is propagated very important for safety application but a clearly a malicious user could propagate uh, the wrong data and uh, damaging, so we want to authenticate standards. You do it with public and private key, lots of overhead, and besides, you fall into other problems of privacy because then the, the next thing that we are concerned about uh, vehicle and networks is not to disclose to others where we're going. You know, if I keep telling others what my ID is, like a public key, then the system can track my motion and use it against me. So problems are complicated and the, the solutions, so the real challenge is the real time constraint. If the cars are fixed and I have the infinite time to solve the problem, not, you know, it would be like uh, all of this problem. Consistency, you know, service. Now, and uh, these are well-known problems, but uh, it turns out that when you do dissemination, there is another problem that comes up. So you want to do, you want to disseminate the data that you discover, for instance, in a way which is selective and also private. And let me illustrate that with uh, two examples. Suppose a driver, taxi driver, uh, wants to alert all the cabs of, of company A uh, that happen to be on Washington Street between 10 and 11 p.m. that the convention that there is a convention there, and ATD, attendees need rights. So I want to tell, I you know, discover that, I want to tell my colleagues that there is an opportunity there. But I, want, I only want to tell my, let's say the company, yeah, my colleagues in the same company, and only if they happen to be in Washington Street at that time. Because if they are at the other side of the town, why waste my time and tell them? Okay, so. I want to disseminate, I want to be selective, right, and private, so, you know, uh, covert. And here's another problem. Suppose a police agent has detected dangers traditionally in a certain area of the city. So he definitely wants to warn the cars in the radiation area only. So only those car, of those cars, I will tell them, look, there is a problem there, and you better get out. I don't want to broadcast to the entire city, because if I broadcast to everyone, then everyone's going to panic, and uh, people are doing irrational things, and pretty soon uh, the traffic is clogged, and people may as well uh, get off their cars and start walking, right? So I want to be very, very focused to that area. Um, and I want to also notify all the paramedics and farming in the larger surrounding area to go and converse. And maybe you also want to warn the, the cars, not in the area, but surrounding areas, to avoid that area without telling them what's going on. Otherwise, of course, they will go in to check. So these are the problems that so far have not been solved yet. And they're very difficult to solve because you have a real time constraint. If you have to identify the, <coughs> the uh, color connotation, which has to do with the situation that the cars are in location and time, you know, and also class paramedics versus uh, uh, 
And uh, so we actually were able to solve that, and I'll just give you the hint, and then if you're interested, you can talk more about that, uh, by using so, so-called situation aware trust. So the trust, or the group of uh, users you want to, which you want to share this uh, secret information, is situation, there is a situation awareness, sorry. Situation awareness. So, um, so in fact, the attributes that uh, on which we base the trust are affiliation. So the car is a Elix car. It happens to be at a certain place at a certain time. And uh, so these two attributes, time and place, are dynamic attributes. And then, uh, and then there are static attributes like the affiliation. And the static attributes I can be bootstrapped by social networking or by other means. Uh, but the dynamic attributes are more critical because these are changing. You know, so users must predict where they will be in order to get the proper credits. And, uh, and uh, one technique that lets you do that is a technique called attribute-based encryption. You know? And uh, just to in the give you access. Idea, you know, so suppose this is a driver that wants to alert other drivers. So he figures out that uh, he wants to alert drivers in a certain company. There must be taxi cabs. There must be in Washington Street between 10 and 11 a.m. and so particular day. Uh, so and that defines a policy tree in within uh, the uh, uh, basic architecture policy tree, of which one part is uh, static and the other part is dynamic. Right, and uh, so vehicles would acquire uh, the credits for uh, the data encrypted based on this policy tree. The um, originator encrypts the message using his attributes, the attribute, the policy tree, as he would do, you know, using a public key. So typically, you take the public key, encrypt the data, and send it, and then only the, uh, the receiver with the private key decrypts. In this case, only the uh, receiver that satisfy those encoded attributes. So the receiver who have acquired the credentials to decode this tree can decode it. And so you assume that the receivers have already acquired this credential ahead of time because they could anticipate they were going to be there. So this can be done with zero latency. You know, I pump the through. And it is also, you know, and the, the sender also signs. So I'm sure that this is a, an authentic message. And, uh, and uh, only the intended receivers get it. So they preserve the privacy and the selectivity. So I think this is an important uh, uh, contribution to this uh, work on dissemination. Now, um, well, two minutes left, right? I'll say a couple of things. So we are building a testbed at UCLA. And uh, we have been lucky to uh, secure the collaboration of the facilities on campus. So 30 campus operated vehicles, including shutters, trucks, also commuting vans. So the commuting vans come in and we're using them to probe pollution and to, and to monitor traffic. The campus operating vehicles will allow us to do experiments with the car storing, and control and dissemination, right? Also have private vehicles to force particular traffic patterns. And uh, um, I discussed some of you before that it's very difficult to access infrastructure to common access points before because of uh, um, authentication protection. So we built, we have built our own uh, infrastructure. It's a mesh network, and uh, the facility had to actually install poles, you know, on top of which are the access points. Some of them are uh, solar powered, and so we got this infrastructure in place. The, the radios are commercial dual processor radios. Uh, this is an old antenna. The new antennas are a bit thicker. So the cars will have this radio in the trunk. And they'll be driven by city managers. We don't do anything they drive anymore. And we want to make this uh, test, but also available through the um, internet. So if one of you wants to say, in John wants to run his favorite mobile experiments, you get it on the internet and give you access, you can upload your routing algorithm, dissemination, and so forth, and then 
uh, the system is yours. Actually, we are more ambitious than that because we have virtualized this test, but so the multiple users can use at the same time, but we will see what happens then. Uh, so, shared virtualized environment, and uh, so it allows collection of traces and so forth. Uh, we've done some experiments. In fact, uh, um, in, one, in one experiment, we have cars. We, we are in, installed the audio, um, OLSR in this car, so they teach you know, the topology of the cars, and they drive, and uh, the lead car propagates the topology back through a separate channel to our control console, so you see actually the topology of this car moving, and we notice that that breaks up when uh, some cars turn the corner, so we have a good handle on how propagation uh, uh, work in our environment. So conclusion. So, uh, as you, I hope that convinced you that there are lots of new research opportunities in, in Manets beyond what you've seen so far in conventional Manets. Um, there is, will be a lot of emphasis on mobility models, uh, measuring uh, what happens in a real urban environment, then constructing proper models. Also, interaction between the motion and uh, the network, you know, because uh, um, what I learned from others may actually change the way I move. So this is an important area of research. In routing or geo-routing, they turn out network coding, and the entire range of new applications. I just mentioned a few, but there are several, there are many more applications that are hanging out there. And, uh, and security offers a new, a, a broad range of new challenges. And if that was not enough, you know, think for a moment that this is vehicles moving, but pretty soon, you know, even your cell phones would be powerful enough to do all this. So the next step is to look at uh, uh, users, cell phones as, uh, as uh, mobile platforms. And in fact, one of the projects we have and is sponsored by Bob Bowman and Aero is uh, the interaction between uh, the uh, uh, vehicular sensor network and the, uh, it's, uh, the soldier sensor public. So how they interact together. So there are a brand, I mean, the broad set of possible applications waiting for us. And uh, so still lots of exciting research areas. But one important point is that whatever we design, we should validate. And that's why you are engaging in this testbed. And, uh, and we, so we have a test you there. If you're interested in sharing it, we would be very happy to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions from the remote site? Hey, it looks like uh, are there any questions on, from NCSD? The accident scenarios and uh, traffic condition scenarios, how difficult is it to avoid false positives? Because you, yeah, I told you the bloom filter, right? I mean, you're referring to the, uh, you're referring to the search. In other words, I'm looking for uh, witnesses, and I may get false positive, or no, not. Uh, oh, they, they, well, I think there was an accident, and there was no accident. Actually, in this case. Uh, um, um, not, uh, the way we describe it, it's not even an issue because the cars are passive, you know, the drivers do nothing. The car observes. And uh, it must be someone who reports to the police that there was a problem, you know, and then the police investigates. Sure, it could be a, a, a hacker or someone that uh, reports a bogus accident, then there would be a waste of time for the police, right? The police actually will find the individuals in that area, will download the video, will discover there is no accident at all. If that's what you mean, yes, that could be false uh, positive in the sense that the police investigates if there was no accident. But Oh, um, in the, so in Dash Express. So, okay, then in that case, uh, uh, somebody reports the wrong position. You know, that is actually difficult because uh, suppose that there are 
50 members. They all say, okay, look, I'm driving now. My, my speed is at one meter per, uh, um, per hour. You know, I mean, I'm literally stuck, you know. And then one of them says, no, I'm going 100 uh, kilometers an hour. Clearly, you know, you look at the discrepancy and eliminate the, uh, the outliers, if that's what you mean. So you look at data consistency, right? That uh, then, you also have authentication. If this guy is doing it often, you have a book is the membership, whatever. So it's pretty easy to, in, in the case of congestion, definitely outliers are detected. In the network coded content distribution that uh, you showed, uh, so do you have any kind of a credit factor or do you just uh, opportunistically broadcast uh, coded packets? You just broadcast the packets with a certain, you know, uh, the, the, the code, in network coding, you have an entire generation, say 20 packets which are being broadcast and you try to get them through. Uh, you just uh, broadcast them at a certain rate um, probably okay. aggressive, you know. Um, but you also there is a concern about congestion. You know, in February, if there are 50 videos being downloaded, then uh, if congestion set up, sets in, then you use back pressure to slow down. In other words, I would like to transmit, but uh, I can't. So I, I, I will not transmit more than the channel can take. Uh, and. Uh, and if there are also in case of errors, you know, packets are lost, and uh, then nodes will retransmit. So there is quite a bit of redundancy built in in, in, uh, in, uh, in network coding that I didn't have to describe. But uh, these are very well understood uh, problems. And Do you envisage applications like uh, instead of manual driving, uh, automatic driving based on peer-to-peer -peer information? Well, the, the big issue is liability. I think it can be done. I think in, in Japan it is being done. But, uh, hey, you know, hey, I, I would love it because if I fall asleep, my car drives. And it can be done. And probably 99, probably safer than if you drove, certainly safer if you're falling asleep, safer than if you drove it yourself. But, you know, if an accident happens, who's liable? That's, that's, so that is a major issue. Any other questions? Um, okay, first off, so uh, if you have these uh, gossips of the metadata of incidents and you have the uh, police doing searches, uh, what about uh, controls on what searches the police can do and under what authority? How do you know that they're able to search for that data and where they got that authority? Yeah, in fact, <clears throat> the police should have a, a court order to do the, uh, uh, the search. Right, and there is also protection of privacy, right? In the sense that uh, when the police interrogates, they don't know who the person is. Of course, once they get your uh, um, vehicle ID to get the data, at that point uh, your your uh, ID is uh, revealed. But then you may request them to give you copy of the of the. Uh, or the court order, you know, with the certificate. Right? So basically, so the major concern in all of these applications is privacy. So they will not do this uh, arbitrarily just to give a ticket, uh, because they're speeding, or, or for some other reason. But the, your, your question is very valid. In fact, uh, the major problem of all these applications is privacy. You must show that you can resolve the problem in a satisfactory way. Uh, about the, um, the the network coding for the the, bit, the network coding torrent, uh, does it mix things that you want with things that you don't want, or just randomly? Like, do you end up getting stuff that you don't need, and if so, do you end up forwarding that to people that do need it? Now, first of all, you only mix within the same same flow. So, if you have three or four different flows, you, you do the mixing only within a single flow. Otherwise, yeah. and uh, if you are a bystander, so suppose that you are driving to Las Vegas, but you could care less about uh, three of these four shows, you just want one. We assume that uh, you 
propagate them all. You're a good citizen, you know, propagate them all, but uh, you eventually get only one. Actually, it can work both ways. If the density is high enough, I may propagate only the things that I'm interested in. You know what I'm saying? And so you can do separate studies. And On the um, situation where I trust, how do the mobile nodes that might have things that they need to get keys to know what keys they need? Because they have some static attributes and some dynamic attributes That's that can be very combined. Question. Absolutely. You know, so, so for instance, we assume that there are certain situations, uh, limited number of situations that will ever be questioned. For instance, uh, um, the situation will be street you're in, you know, and, and, the, and the time. So, you know, time by 15 minutes or an hour. So there are only limited number of situations. And if you predict in the next, uh, um, say, six hours, you'll be in a certain different location, then you go and inquire. You ask the or the key master, you know, or in this case we distribute the key master to give you those credits and the key master will check that indeed you're likely to go to those places. And because otherwise someone may get uh, all the possible uh, keys for all the uh, combinations of, uh, of, uh, of events and then penetrate the system. So there must be some control. You must know in advance where you're going to go, and the, and the key master can check that. So this has to do with prediction, you know. You must be able to predict. Whether you had it? Yes, um, thank, thank you for a very nice talk. Um, I, um, in some vehicular network kind of work before, it has been a criticism that uh, unless the coverage uh, in terms of cars that are equipped with wireless increases to something approaching 70%, uh, uh, the benefits don't actually start showing up. Uh, now, you mentioned multimodal wireless communication. So uh, for these applications, is it true that even if you had fewer cars, like only 10% cars initially that would be equipped with uh, this capability, you'd be able to get a lot of the benefit? Or, or how does that play out? Would you address that? Uh, that's a very good question. In fact, in some applications, you really need almost 100% uh, penetration. So if you do crash avoidance, you know, if you only have 10%, uh, well, uh, in most cases, the guy in front of me or behind is not uh, participating. But for uh, content dissemination, it depends on the range, you know. Go to Las Vegas, maybe only 10% was called subscribe. If uh, there is a dense pack of cars uh, moving, that may be enough to disseminate, right? Uh, so it varies. Um, same thing for uh, uh, you know, situation. I got coalitions moving, you know, and I want to propagate only to a particular coalition. And uh, if my radio range is uh, sufficient, you know, only the um, members that uh, belong to this group will disseminate to the proper destination. So typically, so in peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, as long as there are enough neighbors within my, my radio range that are willing to collaborate, it will work. So in that case, it will help to have, say, cog radios, because I can perhaps ex you know, ex extend the range. To a kilometer instead of uh, maybe 100 meters, lower data rate, but it will allow me to support this application. Any other questions? In the simulations, uh, do you assume a closed uh, system? I mean, uh, do you assume that all the vehicles uh, stay in the simulation area during the simulation time? And none of them uh, goes out of the area. In this particular simulation, like in the Westwood, you know, yeah. they the bouncing boundaries. So when they go to the boundary, just uh, reflect it back. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what may be the effect of relaxing the assumptions? Because then when the uh, average speed goes up, then yeah, well, the probability they, You're that very right. You know, people observe that uh, with this bouncing boundary, uh, the uh, actual... Uh, speed may be different from what you expected, 
But in, in our case, I'm not too concerned with these sort of minor details in this case because I'm more interested in comparing different traffic patterns, you know. Uh, <coughs> with the track, actually, everything can be designed so that it is totally self-contained. Uh, we are random. Well, you may end up. Uh, so I don't think that, although I understand your question, and we could also fix it to, to make it more consistent, we didn't really worry. Okay, let's thank the uh, speaker. Please. Wonderful talk. Thank you.